Good evening, folks, and welcome to our next installment of Inside Black Stories Matter. I am your host, if you don't know by now, Jessica McNabb, and our topic this evening is Black History Month in the Hudson Valley and beyond. Uh, you guys are in for a great show tonight. I know I say that every time, but it just keeps happening, so we're going we're gonna to go roll with that. So first up, you know, I got to bring my girl out the co-founder, executive director of TMI Project, my girl, Eva Tenuto. How you doing? Hey, Jessica. How your mama doing? <laughs> my mom is good. She's in the house. I see her in the list of participants. She's here. Shout out to Mama Tenuto. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> she loves that shout out every time, I have to say. I, I have to shout out. I have I to know. shout her out. It's just not right. Well, if we were in a theater, you'd be giving her a hard time. So. Of of course. Nothing's changed. <laughs> I just, I don't get the hugger this time. <laughs> so how have you been doing? You looking I'm great? Really good. I'm, I'm hanging in there. You know, it's a strange, strange time, but we're, uh, we're doing what we can to keep, keep it moving and, um, and stay connected really. I mean, that's what TMI project's been trying to do is find all these different ways that we can just stay connected during this time in a way that feels meaningful. Yes. Definitely, definitely. And yeah. it's, it's a definite help for me because it keeps me off the ID channel. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Watching know way too much. Just huh? in a greedy way. I always feel better when the, the programs are over than I do when they begin. So I'm really grateful that we're, <laughs> we're able to still keep doing that. Excellent, excellent. And we have a little change up in the lineup tonight. We do, we do. So Victory is not able to join us tonight. And we're sorry to hear that, but she had something she needed to tend to and it was unavoidable. Um, but we had a great solution actually, because Victory was going to read a piece from a performance we did called Reclaiming Our Time. And Dara and Micah, who are the workshop leaders for Black Stories Matter, and our regular panelists on the uh, roundtable discussion were both in that performance. So tonight, we're actually going to get to hear two stories. They're both going to read from that show. So Ooh. we've got a good solution, and we still have a great lineup. Twofer. I like a twofer. We got a twofer. Because I'm a bargain shopper, so I love a twofer. <laughs> two for one. <laughs> so I'm going to, well, I don't know how Micah and Dara will take that one, but we'll talk to them about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring them on in. So um, what we got going on here? Where's my stuff at? Well, I'll just while you're looking, yeah. I'm going to say thank you to a couple people who make go right ahead these events possible. So uh, this event is being sponsored by Ulster Savings Bank and Prestige Toyota. And I also want to give a big shout out to Price Chopper, who just came in to support the Black Trans Stories Matter program. Um, so I'm really thankful to them for supporting our work. And then we also get funded for Black Stories Matter by NISCA. And we received a lot of individual donations, especially in this last year, to keep this programming going. And so we are extremely grateful for that and putting all of your contributions to good work and, um, and just thank our audience for all the support they've given us over the years. That's fantastic. And yeah, um, good stuff. It is good stuff. So I, I found one of them. So we'll, 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 we're we just going <laughs> to roll with this. Roll with um, so on our panel, up first, you know, she's always a superstar. Stoop star in the making. She's an author. Her first book, Great Space of Desire, Writing for Personal Evolution, is a memoir on race, identity, and healing. To use <coughs> in healing. She is also a TMI Project alum performer and now putting her talents to use as a workshop leader for TMI assisting storytellers with bringing the stories to life. Up next, Dara Laurie. Hi, Dara. Hey, Jessica. Hey, How's it going? You know, it's going good, going good. I love being compared to a bargain basement outfit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as long as it's got sequins. She's got to agree with words. But you, that means you're cost effective. <laughs> How about that? We're frugal I'll, with you. I'll start with that one. And, yeah. we're, and we're getting the great end of that deal because we don't have to spend as much, but we're getting something that's priceless. Ah, ah. You 
you spun that one. I like that. Yeah, I like it too. Just trying to lay it on. I got to do what I got to do for my Dara. Yeah. Yes, you do. And then also our other person in is Mr. Micah, a worker and trustee to the Good Work Institute. He is a TMI project alumni performer, a workshop leader. He hosts Hip Hop 101 on Radio Kingston. He also hosts a series um, called, I believe it's called Breathing Together. Am I getting that right? Yeah. yeah. Sound yeah. about breathing. Mm-hmm. Um, I like it because it helps my asthma. Um, and I appreciate you, LBJ. Micah, how are you tonight, bro? I'm doing all right. It's nice to be here. Nice to, nice to see all these faces. It's great to see you too. Yeah. So you guys, uh, you and Dara, Oh, wait a minute. I got one more person I should introduce, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I done talked to him so long, I almost forgot. (laughs) Uh, Who are going to match up? Look how he turned the camera on all fast. You so fast. Look at you. That's what my grandmother would say. (laughs) (laughs) Albert Cook has been a member of the social studies department at New Paltz High School for 23 years, where he currently teaches world history, AP American history, and Black history. Mr. Cook, also an instructor in the Urban Education Initiative at Vassar College, where he co-taught classes on the legacy of Dr. King, the history of the Black voter disenfranchisement, and the history and legacy of mass incarceration. He has lectured throughout the region on issues surrounding the history of African cultures and the development of race and racism in North America. Mr. Cook is currently hosting Black History in the History of Racism in America, an ep- episodic series on Radio Kingston covering a range of topics from the mythology and biology of race to the etymology and historical function of the N-word and a variety of topics related to the present problems that American society faces around issues of race and anti-racism. Welcome, Albert Cook, Mr. Cook, if you're nasty. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I, how, I must, how are you doing? I'm doing great tonight. I must tell the audience because they're probably like, what is she talking about? Just done went off her rocker. What? Well, I found out while I was researching Mr. Cook here is that he can sing, not just sing. He can put down some notes. So I liken him to Janet Jackson. You can call okay. Albert Mr. Cook if you're nasty. <laughs> How's everything much. going this evening? Everything is well. I'm really happy to be on here with this, you know, illustrious panel. It's very um, heartening to join people who are like-minded and also reunion, have a reunion with friends. Even I go back to childhood. Uh, Jessica, I was finding out that um, I know your family since childhood and your family's helped raise my, my kids. And so, you know, and then, and then to hear old hip hop head and an actress and you know all this is beautiful you know it's a very beautiful thing to end black history month with so i'm appreciative of being here i have to say actually that one thing i've noticed now is that jessica has found out that she has family in common or Everybody. knows somebody <laughs> with a special guest for every series we've done now it's listen listen kingston <laughs> kingston <laughs> kingston is a big small town how about yeah, that yeah, yeah it is true how about that? You only have like five black families and then everybody else is related. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not, we, we came from out of town. So yep. I know we're not related to anybody up here. Yep. You got, you got the broadheads and the knocks and you take everybody else, you know, somebody's connected. <laughs> <laughs> That's great though. But it yep. makes for great community though. Yes. You know, and then and that six degrees of separation is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's down to like three, maybe yeah. two. Yeah. So that's a great thing going on with community. And uh, we grew up in communities next door to each other, um, Albert, which we'll be talking about um, a little later on when I right. delve deep into all your business. All right. And put you on Front Street like the Inquirer. No, I'm oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, This is too much. All right. So we're going to, I believe, because I keep running down my run a show, we are going to um, go into some breathing. Am yeah. I there yet? Yeah. I am there it's this coffee. Micah is going to do some breathing, grounded exercises for mm-hmm. us. And um, we're going to come back and chit chat with them just for a second. And then we're going to do what we do. Micah. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Appreciate it. 
And yeah, just uh, for all of you listening at home, this just is kind of what we do in our workshops to really get connected and knowing I can't see you all, but we can connect through space and time anyway. That's what we are here to do. We're here to connect with our stories, here to connect with our truths. And so really just setting ourselves up for that. Just take a moment in your bodies, move it. Just move it around, move the shoulders, move the head. <sighs> Stretch out wide. Open the heart, open the chest. Stretch overhead, reach up high. Let the arms fall back down to the sides. And just take notice if you're if you're sitting in a chair, take notice of the feet on the floor. If you're sitting on the floor, just take notice of where you are touching the ground to get grounded, to sink in, to be connected to the earth. The earth, a vessel larger than ourselves, just to help hold, be a container for us. And then to connect us, we are all on it. In a moment, just take in the breath and inhale, and then exhale. In a moment, to know that the breath connects us. We are all breathing, exchanging carbon and dioxide with our environment, with the planet itself, and we are connected through it. See if we can have some sense of that, even just imagine it. Even through this virtual space, we are connected. I'll invite you to just take three breaths together, just an inhale and an exhale. And another inhale, we're breathing together. Exhale, one more inhale, exhale out through the mouth. Just shake the arms, shake the legs, come back into our bodies, you can jump, hop, twist, dance if you need to, as we settle in to this moment of being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. And uh, Dara and Micah, if I could just have you guys both up on screen real quick, now that we're all grounded. Mm. Surprise, we're grounded. <laughs> um, I would just like to ask you guys a question before uh, um, I introduce you to read your stories. The stories you, you know, you're about to read, can you tell us you know, about your experience when you were creating these stories, uh, Dara? Yeah, um, it was on a Juneteenth celebration in 2017 in the Huguenot um, village. We were invited and so there was a whole festivity. It was uh, food, it was drumming, it was dance um, and lots of people from the community. And it was just a beautiful you know, it was a beautiful setting. And then at the end of the evening, I think there were eight of us um, who had um, signed on to do this overnight in a cellar um, that had previously um, been a slave dwelling that where enslaved Americans had slept. And we had with us um, Terry James from the Slave Dwelling Project to set a lot of context for us and um, yeah, and we, we all went in with different kind of anticipation, trepidation. Um, and I think both, you know, Micah writes about some of that. I write about different, you know, um, we're all carrying our own questions and fears into this evening. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll just add a little bit to that by saying that um, in, our, in our writing sessions, if I remember correctly, we wrote I think the day before, kind of writing from the anticipation place, we then wrote uh, that night, I think when we first got in there, as Dara was saying, after, 
after being around this fire and being together and actually then moving into the quarters uh, we wrote then and I think we wrote in the morning as we woke up as well there might have been a fourth session I don't recall but that 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 became those were the the free rights if you will that then kind of became eventually our monologues which we then performed in a church uh, that was right that's also right there in that Huguenot uh, street area of New Paltz. Excellent, excellent, and thank you. So, without further ado, you guys get a double dose here. I'm sorry. A little bit of ado there. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. All right. I just wanted to mention how, because that just occurred to me in the morning writing workshop, um, somebody was talking about Maxine Waters. Mm. And this was around the time that Maxine had been in, I forget whether it was Brett Kavanaugh or who it was. It was some dishonest person who kept talking too much. And Maxine, sister Maxine said, I am reclaiming my time. I am reclaiming my time, mm -hmm. I'm reclaiming my time. And this conversation was going around the table and that's where the title just, you know, it was clear, it was like a gift. Mm. Yeah, if, if I remember correctly, it was Victory, actually, who kind of brought that forward for us. And uh, so Yeah, yeah I think Victory. she did, because that's what she just put in the tonight. chat. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's here looking, but she... Oh, nice. I think, mm, but hey. I saw a chat. So, mm. hey, baby. So, good luck to whatever you have to take care of this evening. Mm -hmm. um, so, now, Dara, if it's okay? Yes. Let me Without further ado. Rearrange. You get a double dose. Um... We're going to listen to Dara's incredible story, followed by Micah's equally incredibly story. Incredible story. Dara, you ready? I am. Yours. When you asked me to speak about slavery, you are asking me to speak of my African ancestors. I visited with them unnamed and unknown ancestors in dreams and imagine them crowding around me with curiosity and with delight. I have searched then since, I have searched since then to find an authentic way to be back in communion with the ancestors who may or may not have been slaves. When you ask me to speak of my African ancestors, I know, and you know, we both know, that the first ideas that come to mind are of human beings suffering pain and degradation, suffering great sorrow and loss. I have tried to imagine into this experience for a long time. I've read books, good books like Dessa Rose, Beloved, or Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, and too many others to recall right now. And these books, have taken me part of the way into this imagining, but it never felt close enough. The night before joining the slave dwelling workshop, I'm at home writing, trying to prepare. As I write the word slave, a strong voice in my head thunders, we are not slaves. We are not slaves. Is this my voice alone? Am I avoiding something? I had jumped at the chance to sleep in a cellar once inhabited by enslaved Americans. I thought that finally I'd be able to press my nose right up to the glass of that world and look right in. My expectations were a vague mix of fear, superstition, and excitement. Yes, I've inherited my Jamaican grandmother's superstitious nature. Would I be overwhelmed with seismic shifts of emotion or maybe injured by a malevolent spirit. The most challenging part of this overnight, aside from the momentary discomfort, is my fear and anticipation of what collective presence might be revealed to me. Or maybe finally, I would see with crystal clarity the world as my ancestors saw it, felt it, lived it, and breathed it. None of that happened. Instead, I spent a collegial night in my sleeping bag on a clean swept floor in a historic cellar, 
surrounded by fellow writers and seekers. The conversation is ongoing. Tamika is on her luxurious air mattress. Tina Lynn has her hood over her head and is scrolling down her iPad as people talk. Terry James is still wearing his Union soldier uniform and hat with the gold bugle on the crown. It almost feels cozy here with all eight of us sitting up cross lake, tired yet anticipatory on our sleeping bags. I'm sure that we're all wondering what this night will be. Tamika asked Terry if he has a particular ritual when he does the overnight in slave dwellings. Terry raises his arms, which are in shackles. This is what I do, he says, looking sad. He talks about a cold night in South Carolina when he could see the moon through the cracks in the ceiling boards. The room is damp, but not uncomfortably damp. And there were two fans moving the air, which also makes it cold. I'm looking straight at the tall cooking hearth decorated with LED candles, a small vase of daisies, and a wooden image of Elegba, the Yoruba, Yoruba deity, both trickster and guardian of the pathway, who I brought from home. We are eight people unified by a shared space and shared purpose, each one of us scribbling on our pages. This feels intimate, like family, and this is surprising to me. I'm feeling grimy and tired, but good, because I imagine the spirit of this place is glad for our presence. And beyond that, I imagine the spirits of my own ancestors are glad for my attention and my intention. There's a feeling of devotion in this experience. This is prayer, the way I can accept it. I'm feeling very focused here, connected maybe to my co-dwellers, but certainly to my own purpose. This feeling is surprising to me because I think I was fearing trauma and horror from this experience. We don't know, but we long to know. I fall asleep thinking about those who lived here. Were they too hot or too cold in their cellars? What happened if the wife was summoned to the big house? What will the ancestors show me? Upon waking in the morning, one dream is crystal clear. She's a thin black girl, maybe 20 or 22 years old. Her hair is combed into a small natural that halos her head. I've never seen her before, but on this night, she appears to me in a series of confused dreams. Now we're in a room somewhere with others and we are dancing together. It's a funny dance, some kind of folk dance. We hold hands and pull in, up, uh, pull in close up on demi point of one foot, the other leg bent at the knee. Then we pull away, still holding hands. Then back in close, each one rising onto the same demi point of one foot, holding the other leg bent and poised in the air until we fall away out of the small circle and back onto two feet. It's an odd, solemn dance. And I awake with the impression of this girl vivid in my mind. One foot in, two feet out, pull your partner close, then fall away. Climbing the steps out of the cellar, I cross the street to the house with the indoor plumbing, splashing water on myself, reviewing my dream, fishing for details, I'm suddenly filled with a sense of love that wells up in my body. Love, love, love. This was our dance of love. I'm left with a residual feeling of being pulled away from the people I love most in the world. So this, after all that tense expectancy was my meeting with the ancestors through dance. We met in a space and we danced. This is what the ancestors showed me. No matter the physical and emotional pain we've endured, the ugliness of a people and a culture that tried to break our humanity, reduce us to less than beasts, that tried to grind our divine nature to dust. In the face of all that, we, the children of enslaved Africans are still connected to each other and to all humanity by powerful bonds of love and reverence. Does this surprise me? 
not a bit. I felt this truth without words ever since I heard my first gospel song many years ago. I, who am a Jewish Unitarian agnostic with no previous exposure to the tradition of gospel music, heard clearly the deep power of the gospel voice. I knew then without words that I was hearing the voice of divinity and bondage. And when I discovered African dance after many years of struggling to feel myself in the rigid shapes of ballet, modern and jazz, I knew that I had found my true language because dance is a language. It's a language that my ancestors speak. And I have always known myself as a dancer since my first toddling steps, struggling to keep up with the first dancers in my life, my mother and her twin sister. I have always been a dancer and whether I've known it or not, I have always been and will continue to be in communion with my ancestors. I am their story and they are mine. And together, we will always keep dancing. Thank you. I remember traveling around Europe, people asking me, where are you from? I'd say New York. They would, a they would ask what I was, which is really what they wanted to know. And I'd say African-American. They would get this perplexed look and ask, but where are you from? I explained that my family doesn't know. Not knowing is a product of slavery. You don't know. My middle name is Furtick. It's my mother's maiden name. How does an African-American end up with a German last name? Because my ancestors were thought to be property of a German. This history doesn't feel like a distant past to me. I'm also Jewish. I visited Auschwitz and felt its presence, its weight. I touched the past of my ancestors there too. More so, I touched something human. I suspected I'd find that here too something human. Human is not all pretty or humanitarian. It is filled with hate, with dehumanizing vulgarities, with atrocities, but human nonetheless. Fear has kept us. Denial of what we do as humans is still just being afraid. I'll see with my own eyes and accept the human condition accept and give love to my ancestral past, but also accept the viciousness that we are capable of as humans. To connect, to accept empathy in a way which has eluded me and to find it in the depth of this place. I wake up on a hardwood floor, others still sleeping, having seen with my own eyes and touched with my own hands, the relics, the chains, the rooms that kept us the cruelty that kept us, the mindset, our own and that of the oppressors that still has us kept. The night before at the Juneteenth celebration, before we descended into the slave quarters, we sing and I feel that spirit rising up, that lifting up, that feeling of ascension, hearing the voices of my ancestors and the Negro spirituals asking it to let my people go. And it brings me back to my grandmother's church, Centennial, AME Zion. The entrance is on the side, downstairs, I'm all dressed up, maybe my least favorite part, Sunday best, shirt and tie, dress coat and pants. I still don't like getting dressed up. Sunday school is in the basement. The room is large and it feels empty. My grandmother goes every Sunday, religiously. I just go because I have to. Bible study, the choir, gospel songs, we praise God. Who? I ask because I don't get it. And I'm listening to the singing because I do get it. The deep-rooted connection to our past. This feeling like transcendence. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. in quarters for the enslaved, thinking of how it might have been, 
the space that has been lost in time, lost in the semi-factual, all too small sections of a history book glossed over, like an unfortunate thing that happened in ancient history, but at least we have February, the shortest month. This doesn't feel like a distant past to me. The lack of property, of ownership for African Americans today, of a people who did not receive their promised 40 acres and a mule is so very real today. The dehumanization is real today. I still have to talk to my son about how he has to work extra hard to make it, about how he must act if ever pulled over just so he can make it home alive. Too many accounts have happened just in our time here tonight that would remind us all that it is very real today. And if you can't see that, I can't help you. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. My skin color, which though is on the light side, is still real and darker than a paper bag real, dark enough. Dark enough to inherit this legacy of both trials and tribulations and light enough that I have been afforded privileges that if I were darker, I would not have. Someone used my name as an example of why racism today is black people's fault. That black people need to do more to integrate. Look at Micah, he is college educated and comfortable around white people. Don't let me explain all the ways in which the statement is atrociously offensive. And should you need that list, you can, you can talk to me after. But this is what we carry. Even our successes can be tainted. I'm just being me. But how much of that is my lighter skin, my Jewish last name, my polite nature, the way I don't dress, or my ability to speak the King's English? But here in this church, I breathe. We breathe. And we listen, listen for the sounds of truth, listen for lost songs and shed tears in stone and wood. Think of this land and its ribbons of fields and trees. Think of running through them, running through grasses and thorns where there are now houses and stores. And think of running for freedom in the dark of night. And just like the river I've been running ever since, it's been a long time, a long time coming. But I know a change is gonna come. What is this freedom I think I now have? What holds me, what keeps me, what is beyond me? And what songs can I sing? And what stories will pass through me so that I may honor this moment and all before it? And then I think about retribution. Where do we go from here? Europeans decimated the world. Enslaved Africa nearly wiped out the native people of this land, brought opium wars and humiliation to China, causing it to close its doors, took over India and on and on and on. Manifest destiny, they called it. And it's still happening. This is not a distant past to me. It gained so much wealth, power, privilege, opportunity, land, resources, time. Time. We lost time. And time to move forward. While the enslaved took on courage and hope, biding time, Europeans advanced. Today, this amounts to centuries of ill-gotten gains. And it still clings to it, afraid to share unable to ask for forgiveness because doing so might mean having to make it right. It might mean having to pay that debt. And don't get me wrong, Europe just got to it first. This is a human problem. This is the great privilege that was gained, time. Time spent free while my ancestors were enslaved. Time spent pulling themselves up by their bootstraps while my ancestors spent time cooking and cleaning and working for others by force. Hell, my grandmother, just in order to get a proper education, had to cook and clean for a white family in South Carolina. There is a legacy of pain. How do we feel that? The fear of recognizing it seems too great. We seem to think recognizing it will drown us in it, drown us in that muddy water. That it won't let us go if we let it in. Still losing time. It is hard to get time back. Still losing time spent in prison time spent being extra polite, time sitting in detention, time spent expelled, time on the corner, time in rehab, wait, we don't, we don't get to go to rehab. Time spent on parole, time spent explaining our blackness, time spent working extra hard to prove ourselves, time spent together too. Time like a verse and a chorus, time sung through and over generations, waiting in the water. Time. Retribution is about giving time back. If time is not given back, eventually time is taken back. This perpetuates an endless war trading time. 
There are few, if any, examples of humans relinquishing power of their own free will. We as humans need this, to redistribute power so that way we can all have time. Time to rejoice, time to sing. It's time to reclaim our time. I'm in Centennial again. It's been decades. It's my grandmother's funeral. We cry, we laugh, we hold each other and on to each other. And we also sing. And I feel that spirit rise up, that lifting up, that transcendence, that ascension from the mud, from the shackles, from the past into a place not heaven, but in harmony. And we say, amen. Amen is a word I enjoy hearing even if I don't say it often. It doesn't matter if God is believed in or not. No need to get tripped up on the words. No need to question such trivial things. It is simple. It is beautiful. It is love. And here in this church tonight, following the sacred sharing of stories, stories which have been buried for far too long, I say amen for my ancestors. Amen. I say amen for those who suffer oppression today. Amen. I say amen for those of us here tonight who will use our voices to affect change. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Micah and Dara, for those incredible stories. So powerful. Albert, you want to join us? How are you, Mr. Cook? I am feeling very moved. I'm feeling very moved by those stories. That's how I feel right now. Well, that was sort of my question, if you like want to go. Like, how did they make you feel, those stories, you know, hearing those stories? Um, I, uh, I want to start with um, Dara's story. It was, you know, both of you are outstanding storytellers. I expected that. Um, I did not, uh, you know, and I anticipated even the emotional response that I had, of course, to those stories. Um, you know, but I closed my eyes and listened to um, Dara, your story, and thinking about that little girl who comes and dances with you. My heart was leaping with her around you and the falling away, everything was too short. Like I I know you had gone on enough when you were coming to the end of the story, but I wanted it to go on longer. I wanted the dancing to go on longer. Um, and the beauty, the beauty of, of that story is an eternal truth with black folks. And I, I just wanna talk to, to those of you who are listening out there, but also to reaffirm to my brothers and sisters that we seem, to constantly make beauty from ashes and diamond from coal and uh, light from darkness and warmth from, from, from draft and you know uh, pleasure from pain. And, and everybody points to us and says, oh, they got soul. But you know, isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting to say identifying that thing is soul? What, what, what is a soul but life? A soul is evidence of life. A body without soul is a dead body. The Bible says that God breathed into the clay and man became a living soul, right? And so what made the clay a living soul? The breath of the divine, the breath of God, the spirit of God into the clay made a living soul. And the thing that they identify us with is soul. That's the thing we sprinkle everything with and it becomes love and light and life. And what, I'm, what, I, what I heard again from your story about the dancing girl is you were in that place anticipating trauma and pain and your ancestors, the spirit could have come to you and spoke to you about death and about torture and about darkness and about pain and about agony because that's the reality of the experience of being there. But it came and danced with you and breathed your air and brought you close 
you know, and that thing, but that's, that's powerful to me. And, you know, uh, Michael, when you ended, when you ended that story with your voice, right? And you're singing those amens and the amen means let it be, right? Let the fight for justice be, let the, the springing to life be, let the love and the joy and the memories be, you know, those, 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 that word is powerful. It's an Egyptian word that the Hebrews adopt, by the way, right? Amen Ra. Amen Ra is one of the deities of the Egyptians, right? And Ra is the sun god and Amun or Amen is the glory of the sun god. And so whatever the glory of the sun god says is going to happen. You know, that's the power of the sun, right? And so when the Egyptians would finish saying a spell or incantation or a hymn, they would say, Amen, Amen, right? Let it be, let it be. And the Hebrews spent 400 years in Egypt and they adopted that. So when you prayed, you know, you, you prayed your will to God, let, let it be, you, you cried your tears, uh, let, it, let it be, you fought for justice, let it be. I really, I really felt that it was very powerful. It's very powerful. And, um, you know, the, um, the power of music that you were talking about, both of you mentioned how gospel music lifted you. And it's something, you know, black folks, <laughs> we, we really, I mean, we really are something. And I'm not saying that out of any arrogance. I'm saying that, you know, every single time, every phase of our history, you know, you look at blues, jazz, hip hop, you know, country music, rock and roll, every original music form of this era of time has been produced by us, every single one. Right, All, the oldest music that is not produced by us is music that they'll, they'll call it classical, is music that is only preserved almost in a historical museum kind of way. You know, I'm not saying that classical European music isn't played, what I'm trying to say is it's, it's a preservation. There's a lot of, there's not a lot of new music like that being produced, but all of the modern music that we inherited today is being produced by us and it's beautiful every time it's a statement of our resilience and our desire to remain alive and this last thing i want to say that is really inspiring to me about those stories is that um all of our music all of our actions all of our swagger all of our um masculinity femininity all of our usness all of the blackness all of it is a statement to say that despite what you have done, I'm still here. And you can't, you can hold my body, but you can't hold my, my mind. You know, you put your finger right here, that's your temple, right? What dwells in the temple? God dwells in the temple, a spirit dwells there. You can't control my spirit. And so out of my music comes my spirit. Out of my dance comes my spirit. Out of my flow on the basketball court comes my spirit. You know, my out of my you, uh, slang and my vernacular comes my spirit. My creativity and my dress comes my spirit. Out of my hair comes my spirit. Everything has this like, radiation of life, the smile that comes out of my face when I'm happy is my spirit, my music, the clapping and the swaying is my spirit. And it comes, it comes out of us despite what you're doing. And I was talking to one of my um, students and I said, um, you know, black women especially need power and position today. And they were like, well, why? I said, because they've been the target of so much, right? They've been, they, you know, everything that a black man goes through, the black woman goes through more, okay? Everything that any white woman goes through, the black woman goes through more, right? But you know, the oppressed people, they maintain parts of their humanity better than the oppressor, because if you're gonna destroy somebody, you're gonna put your foot on somebody's neck, you're gonna rape them, you're gonna sell them, you're gonna strip their clothes off and beat them, you know, you're gonna do all these things. You're trying to make a savage out of that person, but you are becoming the savage, okay? And you're killing parts of yourself. This is part of the reason, you know, whiteness is not a people. Whiteness is an exchange of culture for power. Okay, so I take power, if I'm a Dutch person, English person, a French person, um, you know, the original colonizers, the Portuguese and the Spanish, 
not the Eastern Europeans, not the Mediterranean Europeans, I'm the colonizers in the Americas. You came over here and homogenized your culture to anglicized culture and became white, but you lost a lot of stuff with that. Mm -hmm. And how do I know that? Well, because if you look at an English person in the Americas or a French person or a Portuguese person in the Americas or a Dutch person in the Americas or a German person in America, they don't know their dances. They don't know their language. They don't know, they don't, they barely eat their foods. Okay. And they participate in everybody else's culture. You know, people jokingly call them culture vultures, right? But, they, you know, you got Timberlake, Eminem, Elvis, Beatles. They're taking somebody else's songs and producing their own, but it's copying. It's copying. Well, what are you exchanging? When you lose your culture, you take somebody else's culture, you're getting power. You follow me? So when, you, when I look at the Black woman, when I look at the Black woman and I see her being most disempowered, I also recognize she remains and retains much of our culture. She's the preserver. That's why when you look at our neighborhoods, you see grandma is the hub of all of our life. Grandma is. Grandma is the hub. The black woman is the hub of our life. She's the hub of our life in the church. She's the hub of our life in our home. She's the hub of the life in the family reunion. She's cooking with love and she's putting all that soul into the food and she brings forth all of our memories. She's the collection of everything. And the reason why I think black women need to speak and I love to hear you speak, especially the elders, because you know, when I see an elder black, I'm not, if you're, if you're not black out there, please don't think that I'm not, I'm talking against you. Cause if, if I talk to an Italian person or a, a, a Greek person or a Jewish person, I can find, if I identify you those way, I can find the culture. Irish person, if I talk to a white person, it's hard to find the culture. If I talk to a, a French person who's connected to their culture, I can find the culture. Am I making sense to you right now? So what I'm trying to say is we need to return to our cultures and rehumanize ourselves. And we have to abandon our caste because the caste is hurting everybody, right? And the people that are most likely to help us rehumanize are the people who maintain their humanity the most. And that is the black woman. The black woman has retained her humanity through it. That's she, she strengthens all of us. She strengthens all of us. And I was strengthened by your stories tonight. I'm really, you know, moved. I'm moved by them. And I'm, I'm thankful for you sharing. I'm thankful for you sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm going to drop the mic and thank you all tonight for joining Inside Black Stories Matter. <laughs> We've just been schooled. <laughs> I appreciate you, Albert. Um, Dara, Micah, would you like to weigh in on any of that knowledge that was just dropped on us? Well, I'll just grab the last thread. Um, that, that Albert, I just, I love, I just want to keep saying amen as you were speaking. Um, this idea, I, I can't connect to white culture. What is white culture? But if you tell me where your people are from, you're French, you're Dutch, you're a mix of Dutch and Indonesian, you're this, you're that, that's humanizing. But when you talk about white culture, what is that? And yeah. I absolutely feel that. I absolutely agree. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that too and say that, yeah, I've always noted that too, right? That, that on behalf of white America, there's always been this cultural void. It's, it's no surprise that uh, the first, consider the first American fad was the cakewalk, right? By two black, black vaudeville actors, right? And, and that, that's always continued, right? Then, as you said, the loving of all the different musics and cultures, like all that's always been true because it's filling this, attempting to fill this void that, that, that it chose to give up, right? It chose to give up the sense of culture. Um, and that leaves, um, that leaves a mark. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, and I don't, I don't know how much it comes across in, in my own story, but what, what I felt was that like, even, and I felt it again as I was reading it is, you know, what I want is, is healing for all of us, right? Like it's all, it's all intertwined and like, and that it's, it's less about, you know, this group or that group and more about like, how do we as humans like evolve? How do we heal? Um, it was interesting to read it again. Like I was, I felt an emotional connection to it that I was like, I haven't, I haven't read this and felt this in a while, but um, yeah. 
Thank you, Albert. Go ahead. Well, uh, um, you know that that healing comes from truth, truth, and a desire for reconciliation, right? And I'm going to share a, an intimate conversation that I had. It was I don't know if I can call it intimate, but it was it was a, a raw one. It was a raw conversation I was having with some folk who was very very well intentioned, wanting me to help craft. Uh, some statement about apologies in Ulster County for slavery, which needs to happen, right? And it needs to happen, some sort of apology for what has happened in Ulster County. But as we, as we all talked about it, I said, uh, we have the descendants of slave owners in Ulster County right now. And we have the descendants of enslaved people in Ulster County, some but most of them have left. If they got the chance, they've left. And they're in the areas, New York City, they're in Newburgh, they're in other places where they are less hyper minority, you know? They are out there. But we have history enough to contact people. And if you want healing and reconciliation, you have to have those descendants of slain owner, slave owners who benefited from that and those descendants of enslaved people who were oppressed and exploited because of that, have truth and reconciliation about what really happened over a long time before you could have a statement that says, I'm sorry. And, and that healing, you know, that healing has to be produced out of an authentic experience of somebody saying, this is how I got here in my life. And this is how we got this property, this, this land, this, this, this wealth, these, this, these accolades that came with being a slave owner and being prominent members of the society. You know, there has to be real reconciliation. And out of that reconciliation, you can have the beginnings, I think, of healing. You can have the beginnings of that, um, you know, but uh, and we do a lot of self-healing, but we got to do healing together. We got to do healing together. I think that that, you know, Micah, um, without without the togetherness of it we don't have we're just going to keep yeah. we're going to keep doing our own thing you know when i listen to him somebody to, mm, and they're just moaning they can't even sing their words and their tears are streaming down their face you know when i listen to that i know that person is just mourning by themselves you know and sometimes it's collective mourning in a church or in a congregation or in a family that stuff is healing for us but we need more you know we need more than that we need more than that. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention because it was kind of connected to that night. Dara mm -hmm. mentioned that we went, uh, we partnered with the Slave Dwelling Project, and Terry James was with us. And, you know, I know that their work typically actually involves bringing um, descendants of both uh, to sleep together. Um, and that, and you talked a lot about just what has transpired from there. And, and I know that I think that actually happened once at Huguenot, but it was also interesting to be there while we are, while we are there at Huguenot and, you know, there are descendants, right? And that New Paltz area who, when that museum started to, uh, open up its story to include, uh, more than just the stories that they wanted, um, they, they got pushback from that, right? Because there's a lot of people, we know, there's a lot of people in Ulster County like, well, you know, it didn't happen, didn't happen here in the North, you know? Um, that narrative still kind of persists. And so like, talk about that truth, right? <laughs> like, to like, you know, to break through that, right? Because you can't really get to the repair until you've got, you know, start with some recognition and some remorse. Um, to, you know, to, to even get to the point where you can really do the repair work. Well, the interesting thing to me, and I think a lot of people are thinking the same thing about this particular time in our country, is that um, it's gotten so broke down, you know, the fabric of, you know, all the things that we think we can take for granted about this country have looked so broke down that, it has people um, who, you know, 
may have otherwise thought we need to fix things, but not had a sense of urgency about it. You know, like, oh, let's not rush too much kind of attitude or let's not upset the apple cart kind of thing. Um, I think that this, to me, when I don't feel like in a state of chaos and crisis about what's been unfolding, then the other side is curiosity because it just seems like opportunity after opportunity is presenting, is showing up, you know, delivered to our front doors saying, uh, yeah, this is broke, something's broke. What are the opportunities? What are the solutions? And right there waiting, you know, on the curb are all the folks who have been talking about this stuff for decades. You know, the, the groups, the individuals, the initiatives. I, I mean, I personally feel like in my own life, I've acquired a language to name things that I hadn't previously been able to name about my own experience growing up in this country and being an adult in this country. You know, there were just terms that were not in currency at that point, you know, something that now everybody hears systemic institutional racism, for example, unintentional bias, not unintentional, uh, unconscious bias, you know, I'm just pulling terms that have been added to my vocabulary, maybe in the past decade, that allow parts of my whole experience to just speak, and they couldn't before. So it, it, yeah, this is a stunning time, you know, in, in all directions, stunning. I think there's a brilliance. I think there's a, a terror. I think there's a brilliance or a potential for brilliance. Um, yeah, and, and I know people are scared, and, and, but now we really have something to be concerned about. Whereas before, I think there was just, this resistance to change, like why do we need so much change? Are you, you're exaggerating? It's not as bad as you're saying. And, and now we know it is as bad as we have been saying. I mean, and worse. Worse, yeah. So, my question, because we're um, kind of around it, and, and Micah and Dara have touched on it, but Albert, uh, my question is to you is, is that, you know, what do you do when someone is like, well, it wasn't me, you know, so why should I be, feel like I am held accountable? And I mean, to me, I would, I say if people of color could have ended racism, it would be over, but it's going to take a collaborated effort by everyone to end this. And, you know, part of resolving the issue is acknowledging that there was a problem and this problem has festered over centuries and there there's no quick fix to that. So how do you, how would you explain it to someone that's like, you know, I wasn't here. I didn't own any slaves. Yeah. So um, quit whining. Uh, I have, I'm, of, I'm not of two minds, but I have two answers of that to that. Um, the, my first mind is that it really depends on whether or not I feel that the person's question is an authentic question of desire for reconciliation. If the person is, I feel desirous of coming together as human beings and, and, and being in love, you know, because love means different things depending on your relationship, right? I say to my students at school, I love you. Right, and they don't get confused when my son walks in my class and I say, "Son, I love you." They don't think I love them like I love my son. When my wife comes in; they don't think I love them like I love my wife. I love my job. I love my car. All those different things that I say. So, if you want to operate in love, and I feel that from you, then you know the oddest answer is you you didn't get here without without my ancestors. You didn't get to where you are. Uh, collectively white people without our ancestors. And so uh, you may have not individually done anything, right? Uh, and, but your, your wealth and the, and the power that you have relative to the wealth of black folk in this country, the property that you own and the businesses that you own, the profit margin that you inherit the ability to get to schools that are great for you and that reinforce your narratives. Like all these great things come at the cost of a people. 
And, you know, um, the first thing, like if you get into a real sincere discussion about that, the first thing that people feel is guilt and shame and a little bit of anger about that. And we got to move past that very quickly from guilt and shame to tangible actions about um, what to do, you know, what to do in my life. And I usually, then I get to my second answer, which is, you know, Native American people, indigenous people have had it even worse than black people in this culture. They're like X'd out, canceled. Nobody hears their voice until, you know, somebody says, oh yeah, and the, and the indigenous people too, you know what I mean? And we don't know their names, I'm sitting here. And when I introduce the Tainos and the Arawak to my kids, they're like, who are those people? And then I say Columbus, they go, oh, the guy that's in the ocean blue? I say, yeah, the people that he killed were the Tainos and the Arawak. How come you don't know their voices, right? So. But when, when, the, when, the, when the indigenous people in New York state specifically have won court cases up in, near Seneca Falls and upstate New York, right? They win the court cases. They say the United States violated the treaty and they have a right to this land and this land. But when they start circling around areas that are residential and there are white people living in homes from generation to generation in those lands, the indigenous people immediately say, we have a right to this land, but we're ceding that right to the people who are presently occupying the land. And, and when I tell that story in my class to my students, sometimes I get tears from those students because they can't believe that they would win the court and have the right to the land and give it back. And they say, well, why would they do that, Mr. Cook? Why would they do that? They won the court case. And they say, because I would never want what happened to me and our people to happen to you and your children. And in classes in stunned silence. And I think, you know, part of being alive, part of having a human spirit is that I'm not trying, you know, black people, you know, black people, enslaved people did some things to get back at their masters that are pretty crafty and pretty terrible sounding, you know, like mothers killing babies by accident, poisoning people slowly with food and things like that. But for the most part, black people didn't try to hurt white people throughout slavery, for the most part. Nat Turner, Nat Turner killed 50, 52 white people in his revolutionary act. Right? And he said, you know what? I didn't want to do that, but I couldn't abide being a slave anymore. You know what I mean? But Nat, Nat Turner was extraordinary. You know, we had, there were 300 different slave revolts in the United States, 300. There weren't three, by the way, that your textbook tell you. There were 300 plus. Black people didn't want to take this laying down. But even given that 300 plus from 1619 to 1860, it's not a lot considering what was happening to us. Black people, we're not trying to hurt anybody. We're not trying to destroy anybody. But this reconciliation has to come. It has to come faster than it is coming. Dr. King was like the fierce urgency of now in 1961. You know? So, and, and the thing is, when we went from civil disobedience to black power and black nationalism, right? And then there was a whole lot of appeasement that happened from the federal government to, to middle class and upper class blacks that pulled us out of the ghetto and gave us all these Cosby shows and blah, 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 blah. Made us feel like, oh, we got it. Just get a good education and keep going, everybody. And it's not the case. We're still getting shot, still getting killed, still getting arrested, still getting felonized, criminalized, dehumanized. It's still happening on a massive scale and our brothers and sisters are subject to it even more a ghettoized America. You know, and so it's like, um, it has to happen. America can't be, you cannot, um, the United States has to save itself from itself. The soul of the United States is at jeopardy and people need to realize that. And white people are the ones that need to do the work to save themselves. You know, Dr. King said, you gave me a check. You gave, you gave me a check, right? And uh, my second answer is that, you know, um, oh, let me finish that statement. <laughs> well, Dr. King said, you gave me a check. The check is for freedom. I submit the check and it says insufficient funds. That's what he said in, the, in this uh, March on Washington speech, I have a dream. He says, every time I submit the check, it's insufficient funds. Put the money where your mouth is. 
So reconciliation in America has to be for real. It has to be authentic. My second answer to the question is that, you know, um, my first answer is, the, you know, you got here by your ancestors owning slaves. And the tr truth is that some people didn't. You know, Irish people and Italian people didn't, largely didn't enslave people. But you know what they did as soon as they became white in America and accepted in America, they took all the power and their privilege and they used it against us anyway. So there's nobody is absent. If you're identifying as white, if you could pass as white, you, you're not absent from the equation, right? So we have to, we have to discuss all of that we have to discuss all of that. Spectrum TV came to my classroom and they, the poor folk, they can't run the lesson. They wanna run the lesson that they observed, but I gave them the lesson on the N-word. <laughs> I gave them a lesson on the N-word and the editorial was like, that's too heavy to run in two minutes. And I'm like, yeah, it is. They're like, I said, expand the spot. They're like, we got four minutes. They're like, it's too heavy to run in four minutes. I'm like, yes, it is. I'm like, it's an emergency. We're in an emergency. Do something with it. The poor reporter is like, I'm going to try to do something in consultation with you to try to see if I can make this work. I'm like, okay, fine. We could try something. But we, we just don't have time. We don't have time. Um, was that the answer to the second part of your question? I think so. Okay. Because we had it in the, in the chat. What is this? I see it in the chat. This person isn't sincere in saying they didn't own slaves. I, can't, I, I don't have time for you. Okay, that's, the, that's my answer to the second part. Mm -hmm. I do mm -hmm. not have time anymore. Yes. Okay? I, I don't have time for you. If you're not sincere, I have to uplift my people. I got to educate my people. I'm lifting them up. We're doing internal economic uh, uh, um, development. We're doing internal psychological and spiritual and social development. We're, ex we're trying to purge the mind from white supremacist ideology. I'm not trying to worship you and your music. I'm not trying to worship you and your political system. I don't care if you call me a red communist, if I think communism is better for me. I don't think, you know, all the things that, you know, I'm reading, I'm reading my voices, my ancestors, Okay, the, in my, I'm not reading what you said about Marcus Garvey. I'm reading what Marcus Garvey said about Marcus Garvey. I'm not reading what you said about Malcolm. I'm reading what Malcolm said about Malcolm. I'm not reading what you said about Martin. I'm reading what Martin said. And I'm reading about Fannie Lou Hamer and I'm reading about Angela and I'm reading about the Black Panthers and I'm not reading what you said about them. I'm reading, you know what I mean? I don't have time for you. It's fine, goodbye, goodbye. Because they're, the babies are dying. Babies are dying. I got my, my, I got a senior and a freshman. My senior is about to go to college. I'm afraid for him. I don't have time if you're not sincere in your loving of my son. I don't have time. So that's my second answer to it. It's like, goodbye. Okay. Come back when you're ready. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. And, and that's really, it, it's a, it's a hard truth, but it is a truth that, you know, has to be told. And, you know, we just, I just want to drop the mic every time you talk. I really do. Um, I want to kind of not even so much shift gears a little bit, but because you grew up, you know, in the New Paltz Highland area, right? How do you think that affected you on, you know, your career choice to be a history teacher? You know, like, like in a shortened version, uh, like, what was it like growing up in the area? And did that determine, you know, where your career path was going to go and make it expand just beyond, quote unquote, American history? Um, yeah, it definitely influenced my decision to be a teacher, not just a history teacher, but a teacher, because I didn't have um, any black teachers at all growing up. Right. I had my first black professor, me too, Micah. Right my first black professor in college, I didn't have any black teachers, elementary school, middle school and high school. And so I was like, when I decided I was gonna be a teacher, I didn't care what kind of teacher I was gonna be. Uh, I needed to be a teacher for, and I needed to be a teacher in a mostly white school. And at the, a lot of people, you know, sometimes I regretted that, right? Sometimes I'm like, I needed to be a teacher somewhere else, right? But I'm, I'm gonna do my thing, I'm gonna do my thing somewhere else too. Right. But for the 5% of black kids in my school, which is what I was even less, they need to see black teachers. And then those other white kids need to see black teachers as well. Right. So I'm there for that reason. And I'm going to, I take my time to give to my community as well. You know, I, I, I definitely 
am not just working with white families and working with white kids, but it affected the way that I think about, you know, my, my professional track. And it also affected uh, the fact that I chose um, history to be the thing that we talked about. You know, in the beginning of my career, in the beginning of my career, um, you know, I wore my hair close crop and I didn't walk around with them. I had, you don't see my little black fist, black power fist on my jacket sometimes, you know what I mean? Like all those kinds of things. But as I established myself in those spaces, you know, I was consciously always thinking about, I have, I always have to speak for the children, the children that don't have a voice in this school. I always have to speak and advocate. And, you know, that's always been my role to the point in which people just come to me when they have a problem, you know? So uh, yeah, it affected my career choice. It affected history, you know, and black history, but um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not finished. I'm not finished yet. I have plans when I retire. I got eight more years before I'm done. And uh, I still have, I have plans for uh, a school for black kids All here right. in Kingston. Yeah. Holla, I'll come teach a comedy class. Yeah, no doubt. I got you, I got no you. Doubt. So, so we do have a question. Um, from Sarah, uh, and, and this is to all three of you guys. Uh, in your wildest dream, what are the the three next things that happen in this country? Mikey, you want to chip off first? Or Dara, you know what? Ladies first. I guess you saw the little ticker tape across my mind. I see, um, I seen your question. I seen your answer come, so I better grab it while it's rolling. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if this is the biggest vision, but it's what's in front of us, I think, is the John Lewis Voting Rights Act needs to happen, needs to happen. Because, I mean, that's lost ground and that needs to be regained and um, we need to go from there because um, all the forward momentum that I think we're feeling possible now uh, could really end up in a ditch again if we don't attend to the most fundamental elements, I think. And um, we need to get voter rights back in place. Just go take one out of three. You good with that? Uh, I mean, I'm good. Yeah, you know, I'm still, I'm slow. I'm real slow with understanding how the world works. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, if I could just have one good answer right now, okay, you know, because otherwise I'll be just talking about reparations. But that's <laughs> I'm gonna need my too check big. too. I'm talking yeah, about right? stimulation. The, st <laughs> the, st <laughs> st the question was wildest dreams. Wildest dreams. <laughs> All right, okay, okay. I'm Go gonna take it. you up on it. One more. Um, I would love to, and I just watched the first in the series of uh, the 1619 Project um, is doing a series called um, Champions of Literacy. You can find links to it and watch it. It's the last, last night's first uh, session was excellent. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, I wanna see those curriculums in schools across the country. That's what I wanna see. Excellent. Michael? Hmm. This is a tough question. First of all, before, before I get to it, though, I just want to um, I really want to thank Albert. As I, you, you noted, I raised my hand to Albert when I said that I didn't have any teachers that look like me. And it really, honestly, it wasn't until more recent in life that I began to really, like, dismantle what that meant. Right, that like things that I have assumed throughout my life to be my nature, um, shyness at one point, um, even just at times a lack of ambition or lack of motivation, things that I took to just be, well, it's just me being me. Only more recently in life did I reflect on, oh, or is that actually nurture or lack thereof, right? Like how these things that have seemed like they're me, how much of that is actually impacted by the fact that I didn't have anybody that looked like me teaching me um, and maybe even sadder is that in schools that were mostly black right in Mount Vernon New York and then in the Bronx um, so it's it's with immeasurable gratitude that I have for you um, doing the work that you do Albert thank you um, and into that question you know it's it's um it's a hard question for me to answer I do really enjoy thinking big 
And um, but I, I tend to have a different take on things. Like if I'm honest, the first question, the first answer that popped into my head is, um, I, I think what we currently know has to fall apart. I think our current systems have to dismantle. Um, I think in the path to getting there, I think seeds of possibility need to be sown. I think connection needs to be made. Um, and that's why I do what I do. But in order for us to really, as humans, um, create something new, something that's regenerative, something that is life affirming, um, this has to crumble. And, and I know that sounds harsh. I know it's, I know it'll be rough, but I also know that even in our personal lives, change doesn't come with rainbows and sparkles and unicorns. So I don't know why I would expect it to be anything different for the collective, but change is what I want. And I'm tired of being told to wait for it. Now, but we'll let you uh, round this up. You know, I, I, I agree with Micah and, and, and Dara. You know, when Dara started with the, um, the Voting Rights Act, John Lewis Voting Rights Act, my wildest dream would be that all the acts, that's the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act, that's the 1965 Voting Rights Act, that's the 1968 Civil Rights Act. Those are the landmark victories of the civil rights movement, that every single one of those acts would be not acts but law in this country. Um, you know, an act has a timetable to it. It is subject to votes every year, those four years, every four years that they are up for voting, people vote against them and they're voting against them for various reasons, but many of them are voting against them because they do not want to lose political power in this country, especially in counties where black people are dominant in votes. Like Georgia should have been blue long time long time. It's a victory, yes, what Stacey Abrams did there. But long time Georgia should have been blue because there's too many Black people down there in the metropolitan areas, okay? And there's North Carolina should have been blue. Virginia should always be blue, okay? Texas is turning blue. All these places, because there's so many, there's so many of us, uh, you know, when I say blue, you know, I'm not foolish enough to think that blue means that our interests are gonna be met. I'm just saying that exercise of political power by black people should have been realized a long time ago in some of these places where most of us live, okay? So my dream is that we get rid of all these acts and that we have laws that replace them that are permanent and my citizenship is not subject to some racist vote, okay? My other hope is that black people all over this country start developing pods where we're educating our children about black economics and not necessarily just about political rights and social dignity. Political rights and social dignity are beautiful, right? But the thing is that this country is cap very capitalistic and materialistic and um, everything political and social emerges out of the material or the economic, meaning that when I own something, there's gonna be laws to protect the ownership of that thing. That's the nature of capitalism, the protection of personal property. And when I own something, uh, there's going to be a sense of uh, self-work when I say, you know what? My brother and I built that house. You see that? Look what we did. We built this part and this part and this part. And I'm, we're, we're, we're keeping that up in this neighborhood to raise the value of this whole block here. And we're renting it out to folk that can't really afford it. And we're trading goods and services for rent here. So folks who need to come into this, this block for housing, we're doing this and we're trying to do this all the way through wherever there's derelict housing in Kingston and Newburgh and Poughkeepsie. We need to talk about owning property so that when they talk, sit down and make policy for a neighborhood, the people who own it have to come to the meeting and that's us, right? We don't need to own any more cars. We don't need to own any more changes of apparel. We need to look at we need to look at what it takes to invest and turn those investments around. Now, I'm not talking about we need to replicate capitalist ideology. I'm talking about we need to we need to have a say in our neighborhoods and stop. We, we have to stop gentrification. We have to stop that pushing us around Kingston, you know, wherever they want us to live. That's where they get to push us. You know, that 
we just need to stop. It needs to stop. And so in my wildest dream, we we become economically conscious and aware, especially considering the um, young men that we are raising that become millionaires in entertainment industries. You know, we need to be more conscious and have uh, better examples of economic development. Thank you, Mr. Cook. I sure do appreciate the education that you have afforded us this evening and, and the thought process to get um, you know, people thinking differently and more rationally and, and simplifying it for us. Um, I'm sorry we have one more question, but it's very kind of deep and I'm sorry we couldn't um, get to it, but I will mm. pose it to them and maybe I could get to the answer on the chat. Um, so we, at the end, we talk about some action items. We're gonna do this real quick and then we're gonna bring Eva back. So some action items for everybody to take away from this evening to uh, better align yourself and be more educated. Um, the TMI podcast project season two, Black Stories Matter, listening and discussion guide. Also, Albert Cook, Mr. Cook right here has a very, very interesting 10 part series on Radio Kingston. Um, which came on Tuesday nights on um, Jimmy Buff Loves You. That's how you can find the link to that. It's um, 30 minutes of uh, 10 different topics, which is really amazing. Um, check out Black History Month Kingston calendar for the, the remaining um, events and stuff that are going on uh, in Kingston for Black History Month, uh, ending with the gala on Saturday, which I'll be hosting. We're going to have a good time. We got an online auction. Come and check it out. And also to check out uh, what Dara mentioned, the 1619 Project Champion of Literacy, which I am going to watch, not tonight, but maybe binge watch this weekend. So I would like to uh, bring Miss Eva back for a few quick announcements um, while she's getting her screen on. Eva. Hey there. How, how are you feeling about the evening? Oh my God. Really incredible. Thank you so much, um, Albert, for sharing all of your wisdom and expertise on these topics. I'm really grateful for you participating in this conversation. And of course, to Dara and Micah for sharing your stories yet again to get us started. Um, and Jessica for holding space and, and moderating this conversation. Um, this work that that you're doing is so so important and i'm so grateful that you're uh that you're here and a part of tmi project tonight so thank you mm, thank all of y'all yeah i just I trust to me. let our audience know that if you want to engage in other work that we've got coming up um right now we're in the midst of doing a black trans stories matter program for the first time and we're doing a national call for stories um, and I've gotten an incredible response, but if you are interested or you know anyone who you think would like to apply, the call ends on March 1st, and then we'll be doing a 10-week workshop, a 10-week writing and storytelling workshop that will culminate in a live performance on June 12th. Um, because the storytellers are coming in from all over the country, we will have the performance on Zoom, even if we are able to meet in person at that time, which I hope we will, but who knows. Um, but we are also inviting places around the country to host screenings of that performance, um, either in person or just with their communities. They can send an invite out to individuals to help spread those stories and, and get them heard. It's so important. Um, and then sooner than that, uh, we are in the midst of training seven new TMI project workshop leaders. And as part of their training, they're going to be sharing their stories. We don't have the tickets up yet for that, but I just want you to save the date. It's um, March 29th, a Monday, 7 p.m. We're calling them the Radical Truth Tellers because that's what they're doing. Um, you'll get to meet all of our new workshop leaders in a really personal way. Um, and I think from what we are all seeing already, their stories are absolutely incredible. Um, if you would like to be the first to know about this and any of the other things that we've got going on, just go to our, um, our website, tmiproject.org, and you can sign up for our newsletter there, and you'll get this information as soon as we have it. So we really hope to stay connected to you all. And thank you all again. Yes, and this has been another great edition of Inside, Outside, and Around Black Stories That Matter. It's been great seeing you guys again. I missed you. 
happy end of Black History Month, oh, nice. but not really because we do it 365 and it's just going to be American history soon enough. Albert, we'd like to thank you, Albert Cook, Micah, Dara, for not only being my partners, but also uh, filling in and telling you wonderful stories. We thank you, audience, for joining us again. This has been another edition of Black Stories Matter Inside. Have a great night. Thank you. Everybody hang out. Hmm.